Welcome to Securing Your Drupal Site. Hopefully that's what you're here for. Um, if you're here for securing other stuff, maybe this is relevant to you. Um, but if you're not here for security, then, then we've got a bigger problem. Um, so my name is Greg Kanadison, and uh, I'm a member of the Drupal security team and uh, very interested in security. Yeah, um, th these slides are online, by the way, and uh, there's a link at the bottom there. We'll also tweet about it after um, the presentation. Um, so I'm uh, Greggles on Twitter, Greggles on Drupal.org, Greggles on IRC. Um, I've been working with Drupal for uh, a little bit over eight years now, or a while over eight years. I've been working with, with the Drupal security team for most of that time. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Cracking Drupal. Um, don't be surprised by or thrown off by the fact that it's mostly about Drupal 6 because it is still relevant to Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, amazingly enough. Um, we'll talk about the changes, but most of the things got easier uh, and the principles still apply. Um, I work at card.com. We're a mobile alternative to a traditional uh, branch bank, and we are, like so many people, hiring, but if uh, anybody is interested, I'd, be, I'd love to talk more about that. And I'm Stefan Kolosket. I'm SCORE on Drupal.org. Uh, I've been with Drupal for eight years. I'm a member of the Drupal security team. Um, I maintain the RDF module in CORE, and I also work in the semantic web in Contrib. Uh, I wrote a couple of chapters for the de definitive guide to Drupal 7, and uh, I work for Acquia, and we're also hiring. Um, so we have lots of things to cover today, although we, we will only touch lightly on most of them. Um, this is just an hour session. So we'll talk about server, server environment, server config, personal press, best practices, Drupal configuration, a bit of code, and uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. So we'll start with some general tips. Um, uh, whenever you use any kind of protocol, uh, you, should, you should try to use the secure version of the protocol. So not HTTP, but HTTPS, uh, SSH instead of Telnet, and SFTP instead of, instead of FTP. Um, you should enforce, if you care about your site and your, your properties, uh, you should enforce a, a strong password policy so that your passwords are not easily uh, guessable. Uh, make sure you're also you, your servers, or your, your LAMP stack, is uh, secure on your production and any kind of stage environments. And um, if, you're maintain, if you manage your own hosting, um, there's a trick you can require SSH keys and not let users connect to your servers using a password. So this is all configurable on your servers. And uh, another best practice is to take and especially verify that, that, that your backups are actually working. Um, and there's also a link in there to show you how to sanitize your backups if you want to share them with your developers and you have data that is private. More tips. Um, keep an eye out for your roles and permissions on your sites. Uh, make sure you don't grant uh, to hire permissions to um, to untrusted users, and other tips to keep your site uh, your site settings secure. Um, so look at your permissions. Uh, your, the text formats uh, can also be made insecure. They they are by default secure out of the box in core, but if you go and change the settings, which oftentimes you have to, um, be careful not to not to open security holes in your in your text formats. And we'll talk a bit about that later. If you're using Drupal 7, I guess nobody's using Drupal 8 yet, um, make sure you don't have the PHP module enabled. It's not a best practice, really, but um, some people still use that. And if, you, if, your site, if, your, you know, if your site get hacked and someone gets access to the admin account, um, they can then penetrate your site by running PHP. Um, and there's also, there are some modules contrib that also execute PHP using the eval function, so that's that's not good. Keep an eye out for, that, for those. Um, I think it's like the, some editors do that, so. So here is a list of modules um, with links. So again, you can go and check out the slide later. All the links are live, so you can read more about each of those modules. But secure login um, enforces HTTPS <coughs> on your user login form. Uh, paranoia is too 
uh, threaten your site settings and it, it makes sure, for example, that people cannot turn on the PHP module. Another thing that some people do is they remove the PHP module from core entirely on their on the, in the code, uh, code base. Um, security review, Greg will do a demo of that later. Permissions lock, it's a way to make sure nobody, even if, you know, not even the site admin can change the permissions on the production site. You actually have, you're maintaining those permissions via code. It's a bit like CMI and Drupal 8 or, uh, or features. So that's also in a good, a good module if you want to, if you're worried about security. Um, TFA or two-factor authentication, that's um, a module more and more popular now. Um, it's what, same, same as what Google offers uh, or GitHub. Uh, you basically have to provide two, two kinds of authentication before you can get access to your site. So oftentimes it's like, um, I have an app on my phone that, that um, when I log into my site, it's gonna ask me for a, a token, even from my phone, so. Um, hacked is a module that will scan your, all of your contrib modules and make sure no, none of them were hacked. Uh, and it does that by just comparing the code from your code base with the code from Contrib on Drupal.org. And password policy, um, I mentioned, mentioned that earlier, so you can enforce a specific password policy or a certain level of password policy when uh, your users create a password on your site. So these are all Contrib modules. Uh, you can download them for free from Drupal.org. So there are also um, other other aspects uh, when you're considering uh, making you know, securing your site. Uh, think also about hosting. So it's not only a matter of having a, a configuration, a Drupal configuration, uh, bulletproof. Um, you can get hacked if your underlying stack is not secure. But there are some hosting companies out there that can help you with that. So Pantheon is one example. Uh, they provide an interface where you can um, maintain your code base. Obviously, they they have all the all the um, they keep they keep their servers up to date and they keep the stack up to date when it comes to Linux patches and stuff like that. But they also have an interface to allow you to keep your uh, Drupal core up to date whenever there's a new security release, um, which happens every few months. You know so. They have a nice UI that makes it very easy to merge upstream changes and patches. Uh, Acquia Cloud is another product. Um, uh, and Insight is, in particular, is a tool that lets you kind of do an analysis of your state of security uh, in your code base and in your configuration on your site. So it will go in your database and analyze all the settings that you, that you have on your site, and it will give you a score um, whether or not you're very secure, and it will also tell you how to fix things um, when you when you have uh, wrong settings or insecure settings. And there are many other hosts on Drupal.org. You can go and check them out. Um, so, uh, like I said, um, all of these hosts, and most of them have are tuned for performance, but also security when it comes to Drupal. So all the file permissions and, and all that, that's taken care of for you. Um, you can also subscribe for services where uh, the company will manage your security updates for you. So that's one service that Acquia offers. Uh, it's called Remote Administration. And so you can, you can subscribe for that. Um, so you don't have to worry about the updates yourself. So we wanted to throw in a few acronyms here. Um, so this just to remind you that depending on the kind of sites that you host and depending on the kind of content that you that you ha have on your site, uh, you might fall under certain regulations. Uh, so if you have an e-commerce site, most likely you have to comply with PCI. Um, so there's a there's a link in there for a PCI compliance report um, that was written by someone from the community. So uh, check check it out if you're if you run an e-commerce site. And uh, do we have anyone in the room dealing uh, um, hosting in HIPAA, HIPAA environment? Uh, dealing with, so this is generally uh, having to do with healthcare data, uh, any kind of personal data 
Uh, there's also uh, FedRAMP, FISMA, certification, accreditation. That's for the, the, the government. Um, and again, some, some hosting companies can provide this kind of regulations. They, ha they have those built in. It's part of the, the contract. Um, anyone knows um, what SCADA is? Or one person? And using Drupal for SCADA, in a SCADA environment? Not so much, no. OK, <laughs> yeah. All right, it's, not, it's not so common then. Um, so it helps to think of security as a process as opposed to a feature. So it's not something that you can think of once and then forget about it. It always has to be uh, in your mind, uh, checked every now and then, monitored. So it's an ongoing maintenance. It means that you also have to plan for it. So you need to have a budget for security when you plan for your project. You need to plan hours for your developers uh, and also resources for you know, servers and, and all that, like a proper hosting infrastructure. And you know, managed hosting can offer that if you, can't, if you don't want to think about it. And also, when it comes to Drupal and, uh, and the code bases of all the contribs and core, um, Drupal.org offers uh, a packaging infrastructure, so you should definitely take advantage of that. It's free, and uh, it can let you know whenever one of your modules, one of the modules that you're using, is out of date and has a new security release. So um, that's part of core. Actually, you just have to turn on the the update manager uh, module. So, so Drupal has its own security team. It's composed of volunteers, and so uh, Greg and I and Michael sitting here in the front are part of the team. We might have, oh, Ben is sitting <coughs> here. Ben. Um, so our role is uh, to keep uh, Drupal's code secure uh, in core as well as in contrib. So we work with the community and we try to educate the community on the best practices when it comes to security. And that includes the developers, obviously, but also the site builders, the site admins, the users, the decision makers, it concerns everyone. So um, keeping, um, you keep, everyone needs to be kept in the loop. And that's why we have um, security advisories for every security release. Uh, every time a module gets a new update, a new release because of a security bug, uh, we write our, an advisory for it. And um, so there's a, an infographics here. Um, I won't go into detail, but I invite you to check it out later. There's a link at the bottom of the slide. But essentially, it illustrates the workflow of what's happening inside the security team. So at the top, uh, basically, the first step is we, we get reports from uh, people who found, or who think have found uh, a vulnerability in the module in core or in contrib. And uh, they send us an email or they file a a ticket in our issue tracker. So we'll take a look, and if it's a valid report, we'll contact the maintainers, and we'll work with the maintainers to get them to fix their module, whether it's um, cross-site scripting or any kind of issue with security. If it's not a security issue, then we'll invite the reporter to file a bug on Drupal.org. And then once we've, um, we've worked with the maintainer to come up with a good approach to, for fixing the bug, we'll um, do us, um, an advisory and we'll do a release and everyone is invited to upgrade their modules. So that's when Greg comes in. All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I wanted to, you know, this, this presentation is for site builders and we wanted to talk just a, a little bit about uh, some code elements. And, and as we were looking at different vulnerabilities and which ones were, would be worth talking about, uh, you know, there's the OWASP top 10, which is what the Open Web and Application Security Project feels are the top 10 most important issues uh, that are facing the world. And I think within a framework, we have to take a slightly different perspective about what is the most important because the framework can provide some benefits and protections um, that make it different from just working on a web application in general. So this is looking at uh, code vulnerabilities from all time. And if you go by this list, um, cross-site scripting, access bypass, and CSRF are the most important. 
uh, issues. I think it's, it's also interesting to take a look at it in terms of vulnerabilities as a percent of the total vulnerabilities over time. Um, so one vulnerability that we're not gonna talk about today is SQL injection, which is a super important issue because it can be really damaging to your site. But what is really interesting to me about this graph is that uh, SQL injection, which is in, in green, um, it goes from 50% in the first year that uh, advisories went out from Drupal.org. It's gone from 50% to basically 0%. So, I mean, that's, uh, let's see, that's up through um, October of last year, I think it is. So that's in 2013, there were basically zero SQL injection vulnerabilities. Um, so we, I think that basically what that really speaks to is the strength of Drupal's database API, and particularly the database API in Drupal 7, which has just made it so much harder to create a SQL injection vulnerability. Um, what, we, what we can also see is that you know, cross-site scripting has been a problem and continues to be a problem. Uh, Score will talk a little bit more about that later on and what we can potentially do with Twig and Drupal 8 to try to address that. Uh, we, we can also see that cross-site request forgeries, which is you know, a relatively new uh, or sort of newly described, newly discovered issue. It's been around for a long time, but people didn't really think about it until fairly recently. So um, that sort of like came onto our radar in 2007, um, and it became bigger and bigger and is sort of trailing off now, because I think that the patterns for dealing with that are more well known and people sort of understand it a bit better. In Drupal 8, there are some improvements that, uh, again, you'll see more about that later. And then access bypass is increasingly a huge problem for us. So I think that that's something that we'll have to try to address in future revisions of Drupal core. Um, so the three that we're gonna talk about, the three big ones, cross-site scripting, CSRF, and access bypass. Uh, so cross-site scripting is some sort of, or XSS is cross-site scripting. Uh, it's some sort of code that is running in your browser. People often talk about it in terms of being JavaScript, but it's not necessarily just JavaScript. It can be any other code that executes inside of your browser environment that has access to the DOM, to your cookie, to the URL, to different bits of information like that. Um, it's able to make requests to either your site or to other sites on the internet and then potentially parse the responses. And you know, this is like, this sounds perhaps to, to a lot of folks like Ajax, right? That's exactly what Ajax does or exactly what flash remoting is all about. If you build a flash game on top of Drupal, that's how your game is supposed to work. Um, so the idea is that you know, sure, you can use JavaScript to build rich interfaces or you can use it to attack a website. Um, same tools with a different purpose. So, you know, if you're trying to test a site for cross-site scripting, um, what I like to do is use, you know, there's a couple of different ways that you can uh, demonstrate a cross-site scripting issue. And if you try out, you know, both of these strings, you will catch the majority of um, issues. There are sort of some less common ways of executing cross-site scripting. Um, but the idea is that you wanna break out of whatever the context is, the HTML context, and just have some sort of a, a new tag that's being displayed. Um, so variations on these will catch 90% of cross-site scripting examples, uh, according to my very scientific uh, throwing a finger up in the air and coming up with 90%. Um, so how do we, how do we fix cross-site scripting? Uh, a, a common reaction is to say, well, you know, we should validate inputs and make sure that the input doesn't contain JavaScript. Um, but, you know, if you look at Drupal.org, for example, there's JavaScript everywhere <laughs> that people have input because they're saying, hey, how do I get this JavaScript to work? Um, so you can't just remove JavaScript from the inputs because it might actually be the content of your site. Instead, the, the really the right way to deal with it is to filter the text on output to the browser. And you want to do that as late as possible, but ideally before the theme layer is sort of the standard so that the protection is part of what the code that's always going to run. Um, that way if you switch the theme, you're not going to create a vulnerability because the text uh, has not been filtered yet. And really, you know, again, I talked about the idea of the framework providing protections. Uh, Drupal has a lot of protection for um, cross-site scripting built into it. So uh, the uh, set title function has changed from Drupal 6 and then in Drupal 7 now it automatically will filter text for you. That's just one example, but the, the tools for translation, the T function, that also has filtering built in to protect against cross-site scripting. Um, so here's, a, here's an example. If you have some text that you need to explicitly filter because you're not passing it through a function like T or, or uh, um, Drupal set title or whatever, um, this is a way, this is a flowchart for figuring out what you should be doing in order to properly filter that text. 
Um, and I think that this is, is linked. But the idea is, you know, you just start off and say, okay, is this a URL? If so, I'm going to use check URL on it. Is it plain text? And it's important to think about plain text that, you know, if there's a, um, like a greater than sign inside of the plain text, then check plain will turn that into the HTML entity so that it is uh, printed out as, you know, ampersand GT uh, semicolon. Is it rich text? And rich text is sort of, you know, that, that um, has a special meaning within the Drupal world, really. Uh, that's any sort of text that has a format associated with it. So a node body is an example of rich text in Drupal where there is a, you know, people choose a specific text format to use uh, associated with that piece of text. And so check markup takes not just, uh, takes two arguments, not just the text itself, but also the appropriate format to use. Um, the next one is if you have, you know, some HTML, so an example of this might be a label to display next to a field, then you could use filter XSS on that. And then finally, if it's truly quote unquote trusted text, then you can just print it out directly. Um, and the idea there is that you re like you really, really, really have to trust that text. So an example would be like if you're inputting JavaScript to be executed as part of the Google Analytics uh, scripts on a page. Okay, well, if you filter that for JavaScript, then inputting the JavaScript isn't going to be very effective. Um, so the way to keep a site safe in that scenario is to just use a, an elevated permission associated with inputting text onto that form. Alrighty, so access bypass is uh, second biggest and one of our fastest growing issues. And this is really just people can either see something or do something on a site that their permissions or that their access on the site should normally prevent. Um, and I think what makes this so tricky is that we enforce it in Drupal in uh, just a ton of different places. So, you know, starting at the very beginning of a request, there's the access callback and access arguments associated with a menu item. Um, then also sometimes sprinkled throughout various functions and you know the theme layer there might be a user access call. We have the node access system that has to apply to any queries or just you know printing out a node that's been loaded. Um, there's the entity access system provided by um, primarily, primarily by the entity API module. Um, individual field access uh, you know if you have custom callbacks in other places you know like if you have a custom PHP function you might have to do your own checking of, of uh, permissions. And then again, like I said, in the theme layer and templates. Um, so it's really just sort of all over the place. And um, I don't know that there's a way to really consolidate this and make it um, you know, harder, to, uh, harder to screw up. Um, so I would say that the best solution here is really to just con you know, do a lot of testing whenever you modify stuff related to access. And uh, you know, ideally have automated testing that will run those tests for you. Um, so when I'm looking for looking at a site and trying to identify situations for access bypass, um, I usually do that just by sort of poking around on the site, accessing URLs as an anonymous user or as a lower privileged user that I might want to try to access or that, that might normally be accessed by an admin. Um, you can also look at the menu definitions inside of hook menu in a module file and look for anything that uses, for example, percent node or percent user. Um, see if there's any sort of a, a variable that's getting loaded as part of that uh, function and switch from you know node 1 to node 20 and maybe you know if node 20 is one that you shouldn't have access to either because it's unpublished or because of a node access module and just try that out and I really encourage people to use bhat um, unfortunately if you're here that means that you're not seeing Misha's presentation on bhat um, but uh, it'll be you know online later today or tomorrow and, and you can watch it then it's a, a great tool for testing stuff like this in an automated fashion um, so how do we fix it? Uh, I sort of mentioned this in, in um, how do we, how do we uh, or at what lay layers do we uh, deal with the access system? Um, but there's, you know, as I said, user access function for permissions, node access for any sort of a, a content access module. There's the entity access function. Uh, if you're writing a query using Drupal's Drupal 7 database API, then you need to be sure to add the tag on select queries in particular. And then in menu definitions, make sure that the arguments that you have there are appropriate. I feel like a lot of times as developers, uh, um, people will just copy and paste a, a menu definition and it's not quite working and so they set the access callback to true and then it starts working and you just walk away and you're like, great, it works, awesome. Um, but then that's gonna mean that it's accessible to everyone. All right, so the third kind of vulnerability uh, that we're gonna talk about today, cross-site request forgeries. This is a path that takes some sort of an action and it does not confirm the intent of the user. Um, 
And I feel like uh, intent is sort of a tricky thing for a computer to figure out since that's like our emotions and, you know, um, I know that machine learning is pretty advanced, but I don't know if it can figure out people's emotions about their intent. Um, so the, the way that we figure out somebody's intent in a way that is reliable is using a, a nonce or a token that is generated that uses some information about the user, some information about the site, um, and some information about uh, the action that's about to be performed. And by combining those three things into a token um, and associating that with the action as the action is requested, you can be certain that the user actually intended to do that. Um, so we'll have an example of this later on. Um, but you know, how do, I, how do I test for that, or how do I look for that when I'm evaluating a site? Um, one thing is looking for people who access the super global, so dollar underscore get, dollar underscore post. If you see that in code, it's worth inspecting it a little bit further. And it's possible that the person really knows what they're doing and they intended to do that, um, but it's commonly the case uh, that that's an indication of a mistake of a cross-site request for particularly if you're taking action. Um, after accessing those variables. Um, and then, you know, Drupal get token is the function that we use to protect against cross-site request forgeries. So if you see accessing those variables without, you know, confirming a token. Um, the other thing is looking for a verb menu. So I'll look at, a, again, the hook menu definition and see something like, you know, delete slash all content, right? And if you don't see a Drupal get token or a, a, uh, associated with that, then that's a, a concern. Um, so how do we fix it? So I mentioned the idea of a uh, Drupal get token, Drupal validate token, um, or you can also use uh, the form API. So Drupal's form API since I think 2007, 2008, has included this feature by default. And so if you're building a form using the form API, then you're all set. Um, or if you're, you're building up your own custom callback, then you, know, you have to use those two functions with that tokens. Uh, there's some videos and, and more documentation on the Drupal Scout website as well. Um, so now I'm going to give some demos of cross-site scripting and access bypass. Uh, oh, and where's the thing? You want to say? Right? Yeah. Okay, um, so, so I mentioned, um, you know, this is somebody who's logged in as an admin. Um, so they have actually the permission, right, to, to do this kind of stuff, but I'll um, just, oh, look at that. <laughs> um, it's, uh, score already has some uh, JavaScript for me to uh, just copy and paste here. Um, Um, how's the, is the font size okay? Somebody in the back of the room? Yeah? A little bit bigger. Okay. Um, so the idea is that, you know, if you have... Uh, oh, this one. Yeah, I see. Um, so yeah, if, you know, if you allow somebody to input full HTML into your site, um, then that means that they have the ability to input JavaScript into the site. Um, and so this is, you know, this is the warning sign, right? And uh, what you can see is that there's actually only one of those that executed. So I, I put JavaScript into two different places. One of them, you know, the, the title of the page used the check plane function on it in order to, before it output the text, and therefore it's filtered and it's displaying that script as content rather than executing it as part of the HTML, as part of the code. Um, so it's the second one inside of the body that, uh, that executed as JavaScript. Um, so, you know, as an admin, okay, fine, that's fine that I can enter JavaScript. That's actually maybe part of my job and part of what I need to do. Um, but if you're anonymous users or if you're untrusted users on your site can do that, then that's what would be a problem. Um, so then there's another, um, I wanted to show an access bypass scenario. There's a module called the invitations module. Has anybody used that? That's many people. Um, that's, uh, that probably makes sense because it was unsupported about three months ago for a security vulnerability in it. Um, in, oh, Invitations is the name of the module. Um, 
So what it did uh, is, a lot, you know, provided a way for you to invite people to your site, and it generated a, a token that they could use in order to join the site. Um, but it defined a view to show that information, and that view did not have any permissions associated with it. So if you invited, you know, hundreds of users to your site, uh, then all of their email addresses and their special secret token were available to an anonymous user, and they could just go to that URL if they could guess it um, and see that content. So this is just like a checkbox inside of the view, didn't get checked, the view got exported into code, and then now it's on you know, people's sites. Um, so this is a very typical example of that access bypass. I feel like when, when we put that into an advisory, I'm not so sure that it's clear to people what that means. Um, but you know, exposing information that should be private inside of a site to anonymous or untrusted users uh, is an example of access bypass. All right. So I'm going to talk about, a bit about the improvements that we have in Drupal 7 core. So. Um, this is to remind people uh, who are still wondering why they should upgrade their sites from Drupal 5 or Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, that they should maybe consider doing it. Um, so many, many improvements came in uh, with the release of Drupal 7, so we have a stronger password hashing and salting uh, for the, all the user passwords. So if you get a database dump, you can't necessarily guess or uh, reverse engineer the passwords, uh, which you could do in Drupal 6. There's a login flood control, so uh, people cannot brute force uh, passwords on a given account. Um, there's a protec protected cron, so that's to avoid denial of service attacks. Uh, up to Drupal 6, you could basically hammer the, the cron URL and uh, stress the servers and pot potentially bring your site down. And uh, we also have an update manager, so it's a UI to help you Keep track of your modules uh, and find the ones that need an, uh, to be updated that have a security release. So this is how the UI looks like. Um, this, in this example, the views module uh, has a security update required. So you need to go and upgrade from 3.7 to 3.8. There's also uh, a nice little feature that not many people know about. You can get your site to email you when uh, there are new security updates on your site. So. That's all part of Drupal 7 core uh, update manager module. Drupal 8, so uh, Drupal 8 also has new security improvements again. Um, so the major one that people are often excited about is Twig. So two, two advantages uh, of Twig. It, in theory, it automatically sanitizes the strings on output. So themers or even developers don't have to worry about it. Um, so you don't have to um, to worry about synthesizing your output and this is uh, an example of code that you had to write when you were using when you're using Drupal 7 um, so you did directly dealing with PHP at the template level so you could potentially forget to sanitize your strings uh, so we, here we have PHP variables, um, PHP arrays directly coming in at a theme layer. And um, if you're not careful, you might be outputting a raw string that's not sanitized. Um, and that could lead to cross-site scripting. In Drupal 8 with Twig, we're not dealing with PHP anymore at the theme uh, in the templates. We, we are dealing with the Twig language, uh, which first of all will only output um, escaped strings and um, it's got it on its own uh, logic as well so you still have if and else and loops and all that so you should be able to do pretty much everything you can do with PHP or at least all the things you need to do at a theme at a theme level um, this is in theory so there's uh, an issue uh, going on that uh, CHX is working on that's what Dries, Dries mentioned this morning in his keynote um, so it's a beta broker <coughs> right now, but uh, hopefully we'll have it in Drupal 8 core uh, with Twig. So the um, the other thing is um, 
you're no longer dealing with PHP in templates. So that means you can no longer have things like uh, SQL injections or, or poorly write, written PHP uh, in your template. So, you know, two advantages here in having a twig. So we also have a WYSIWYG uh, in core. So that means uh, wh what's good about this is that it streamlines the configuration. Um, so we have a mechanism that keeps in sync the WYSIWYG settings and the, the tags that are allowed in the WYSIWYG, as well as the tags that are allowed server-side um, in, your, in your filters. So we already had in Drupal 7 the server-side uh, restricted set of tags, but now we have, um, we have the, the WYSIWYG configuration tool also keeping, keep, keeping those uh, server-side and client-side um, tags in sync. So the example with Drupal 7 or up to Drupal 7 is developers would often like struggle like me to set set up WYSIWYG and they would end up maybe turning on full HTML because that, that works all the time. And um, they would grant access to full HTML to potentially authenticated users or untrusted users or anonymous users and essentially give them access to, to hack your site. So. There's also a neat little filter in Drupal 8 that I don't think many people know about. It's called restrict images to this site. So it's a locate local image filter. It restricts the images to, um, the images you can include in your HTML can only be local images. So that means you cannot perform cross-site um, request forgery in, uh, on, the, on the other sites. And I will demo this at the end if we have time. And so to wrap up this session before we, we do questions and demos, um, I just wanted to mention Greg's book, Cracking Drupal. Uh, there's a link in there. You can just go and click on, on the slides. Um, chapter 6 of the Definitive Guide to Drupal 7 also has a chapter uh, on security. Uh, you can read about the security team on Drupal.org. Drupal Scout is a list of articles focused on security. Um, here is the year about to the security report. And there's also a group on GDO for talking about security. And so I just want to pitch in the, that we have sprints on Friday. So if some of you are interested in contributing or learning uh, about security and how to use the APIs that we have in Drupal, and essentially we'll be focusing on Drupal 8, but it's, it's a good way to learn what's coming up. Um, so you're all you know, welcome to join. This is the URL to, uh, to check it out, all the details, and there's Twitter. So um, you can also come, come up to us and talk. I'll be mentoring on Friday, so I'll be helping anyone who needs help. Can and you demo the, um, the yep. local image problem? Yeah. We've got some good time left. Here was some time left? Yeah. So local image? Local image. Um, Search to my Drupal 8 site. Okay, so I have. I have set up um, a page here, which is uh, which includes an image right here. And um, there's an image tag here with a link to a different site. So this is uh, a D7 site, um, and it links to the logout URL. And this is actually uh, the same site as here. So. <laughs> Maybe I'll turn that off first. So if I go to this URL, this is the URL that I go to to when I want to log out of my site. The thing is, I'm I'm working on my site right now, um, and. Just to make it clear, I'm going 
going to make it red. So I'm working on my site. I'm logged in. I'm just about to, new, to add a new node. And someone else um, right here has set um, has set um, a link to this user logout uh, URL via an image. So this is uh, this is clearly a malicious user, and I'm going to save that. So now, when I go and visit this node on my on my other brother browser, um, I'm essentially going to be logged out from from that site. Oh, sorry, I, I went to the wrong. Uh, all right, so I got I got logged out of my site where I was editing content simply because. Um, Someone tricked me into visiting this page that has uh, an image and a CR hidden CSRF in that image. So what Drupal 8 offers is um, this new setting, which is enabled by default, by the way, in, <coughs> in basic HTML. It's called uh, restrict images to this site. So I'm going to turn that on, and I'm going to log back in here. So I'm, back in, I'm just editing my content, and now if I go here, um, this time I have um, a red image. This is basically a blocked image, because this, um, this image was not belonging to this site, and essentially it's protecting from CSRF now. Uh, and so if I go back here, I'm still logged into the initial initial site where I was editing my content. Um, so that's the you know, one CSRF protection in in um, offered with Drupal 8. Um, was there any other demo? No. Or what's the time like? Yeah. We have some so we have. Um, Microphone. Um, so we have potentially some more things that we could demo, but we'd also be happy to take some questions. Uh, if you do have a question, there's a microphone in the middle of the room, which will help it to get onto the recording. And we also want, actually, while we get people to ask questions, I forgot to mention oh, yeah. two things in Drupal 8. Uh, we, we have the PHP module in Drupal 7, and it's been remo removed from Drupal 8, again, to make Drupal 8 more secure. And I also want to point out the built-in CSRF tokens that we have now in the Drupal 8 routing system. So if you have a route and you want to make it protected, so the typical example is enabling a view via some link. Uh, we had, views had several um, security advisories you know, in Drupal 7 because of that, but now all you have to do is add this uh, option in your in your YAML file when you define your routes in Drupal 8. So this will add a token to every URL that gets generated, and when you try to access this route, it will check that you have the right token at the end. So this is neat. So, and if you want to evaluate this session, um, I know the, the organizer, organizers are looking for feedback, so you can go to this uh, to the session URL and give you feedback. And so now we're ready for questions. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. Um, so you, you talked about sanitizing backups. So if, I, if I'm making backups of my site, what are some processes that I can do to make sure that I'm sanitizing those backups um, if I'm giving those out to developers? Um, and maybe also if, um, if I just want to have some backups for, you know, if I need to re restore from my site. Thank you. Sure. Um, which one is it? This one? Yeah. So the um, the idea here is that you should basically have uh, you know a set of backups of your site that are perfect, right? That are exactly right, and you verify that you can restore from those um, very easily. But then um, you know, like I think most people work on their site actually on or or 
in an ideal world, right, we work on our site in a non-production environment. Um, and so whether that's your local laptop or it's a different, uh, different environment, like uh, you know, some hosting providers provide non-production environments, um, you don't want to be working with your live data in those non-production environments, such as a laptop, because, you know, hey, we're all going through security at the airport, and we leave our laptop in the bin, and now, you know, you have to send a letter to the 50,000 customers of your website and, and be really embarrassed. And, um, you know, th the, the, those are the sorts of things that are just a horrible experience to have happen, right? Um, so uh, there are ways to different script examples that people have created for sanitizing your backups, and this, this links to an article um, in the Acquia knowledge base about how to do that. Um, one of the techniques that I think is really great is a tool called Drush SQL Sanitize. Um, and so that is a, um, it's an extensible system for sanitizing backups. So you can write a uh, Drush command that will sanitize information or it's just, you know, either deleting rows or changing data inside of rows. So like changing an email to be user ID plus example.com, right? Something like that. Um, and uh, so by using Drush for it, one of the benefits is that it can be part of the contributed module on Drupal.org, and then when somebody downloads that module, they can get the benefit of that uh, improvement. So, um, for example, there's uh, the Facebook module, fb.module, has, um, has a Drush component that will delete your Facebook secret token for your app, because if somebody got access to that, they could you know, potentially modify your Facebook app and, and log into Facebook as stuff like that. So um, that's one example of a contributed module that takes care of it for you. Um, but it's very important that you know, you're doing that only on developer copies, not on the copy that you could potentially be using for restoring the site. Yeah. All righty. Oh, yes. Uh, with, uh, with Drupal 8 and the CFRF and the images not coming from the same site, how does that affect use of a CDN? Um, so the the, um, the filter in Drupal 8, and there's actually a Drupal 7 port of it as well. Um, uh, so the goal there, it's it's uh, just sort of a, a useful tool for making sure that images come from a trusted source, basically, so that people can't post images that are hosted elsewhere. Um, it has a, a side effect, you know, CS or pardon me, images image tags are one way to um, to exploit a CSRF vulnerability, but there's many other ways to do it. We really all you need to do is trick somebody into visiting that URL. And so you can trick somebody into doing that by sending them a tweet with a shortened URL that ends up at that destination, right? Um, or send them a, you know, a link in a, a variety of different ways that makes them end up on that, that page. Uh, use an iframe rather than an image tag. Um, so CSRF, it's not a, an effective protection against CSRF particularly, but it, it is a good tool for making sure that images come from trusted sources. Um, so specifically, your question about using a CDN with that, uh, I believe that there's a patch to allow whitelisting additional domains so that you could have your site and potentially others, but that patch has not made it in yet. Um, and I'm not sure if that will make it into Drupal 8, but it could potentially be in, um, you know, a contributed module. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I didn't catch that. You said the slides would be available. Where are they going to be available? Yep. I just posted a link to them as a comment on the, um, on the bottom of the session page. So I encourage you to go to the session page and scroll down and fill in the survey, and then you've got the link to the slides. <laughs> Hi, yes. Um, so from we have a lot of questions, sir. Yes. Um, from your slides, uh, cross-site scripting looked like it was really popular in Drupal. I was wondering, uh, you know, you showed an example of an alert box, but that wasn't right. very scary. Is, what are some of the things that maybe we should be worried about with cross-site scripting sure. um, that could happen on our sites? Thank you. Sure. Um, so Cross-site scripting, you know, the, the alert box is great because it, it makes it hard to ignore what's going on. Usually when there's a cross-site scripting attack, um, you won't know that anything has actually happened uh, because the JavaScript just runs and it, it takes actions on your site. Um, but uh, if anybody's a fan of musicals, what I like about cross-site scripting is that anything you can do, cross-site scripting can do better. Um, it, it, uh, it can make requests to your site, change settings, change the password, f uh, well, depending upon which version, change the password for another uh, user on your site. Um, yeah, st steal your cookies and send your session cookie to another site, and then an attacker can use that to log in as you. So really, anything that, anything that you can do as an admin on a site, cross-site scripting can do. Um, that's one of the reasons that I really like the paranoia module, because it prevents execution of PHP. So that way, if somebody has the ability to execute cross-site scripting, 
the worst that they can do is whatever they can do within the interface. They can't use your site as a pivot point to do further PHP attacks. Yes? Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, you mentioned using BHAT uh, yeah. to, could you elaborate on that and give some, maybe give some examples? Sure, sure. Um, so just a, a you know, super simple example, um, if you have a site where people should not be allowed to see, where anonymous users should not be allowed to see user profiles, uh, it would be like you know, two line B hat test to say, given I go to you know, slash user slash one, then I should not see um, you know, some HTML that would show up on a page showing a user profile. Um, and, and, or you know, given I'm an anonymous user, when I you know, go to user one, whatever it is. Um, so that, that's a, um, just one very simple example, but there's the Drupal extension for uh, BHAT. It's a you know, drupal.org slash project slash Drupal extension. Has some different tools that you can say, given I'm logged in as a user with this role, and, and then you can list off a bunch of things that that person either should or should not be able to do, um, and just confirm that they're getting you know, uh, an access denied page or a, a login page, or, or a access denied page or they're getting the actual page, yeah. And what I, you know, uh, what I think is nice about that is that it's, it's very easy to make mistakes with Access Bypass, and it'll affect some totally different part of the site that you don't even think about. Um, and so if you're not using automated testing, then you're not going to catch all of the different areas of your site. Hi, I think this might be my last question. Um, so you mentioned uh, like uh, some modules for doing analysis on your site. Is you, you said that there's a security review that you might demo. Could you demo that one, please? Yeah. Thank sure. you. So, so the security review module is this really amazing module written by a smart guy. Um, oh, doesn't provide a link to the reports page from modules. Um, so I, it's already enabled on this site, and it's inside of the reports area. Um, and and the, when you first visit it, it'll say, you know, hey, um, you have to. Uh, you have to you know, be sure to configure your settings. So security review module doesn't know who is trusted or not trusted on your site. Um, by default, it assumes that the anonymous user is not trusted, which makes sense. Um, and it's, it will uh, set, I think, the authenticated user checkbox based on your registration settings on your site. And administrator, the core, the Drupal 7 uh, administrator role is assumed to be trusted, or yeah, is assumed to be trusted. Um, you can also say like, oh, these things I don't care about or these things, um, and, and check them off as things that should be skipped. Um, so I'm just going to accept the defaults and then go back to the run and review. It uses the batch API because some of the things that it checks can be slow um, on certain environments or depending upon the size of your code base. Um, so there's a lot of weaknesses in this site. Yeah, on the local, <laughs> local host. Um, so this is pretty common, right, for a local host environment that, to have a lot of issues. Um, and some of these things, you know, it's not like the end of the world. A lot of them are uh, defense in depth issues. So on their own, they don't present a risk necessarily, um, but they, they uh, may present a risk depending upon other configurations or weaknesses inside of your site. There are uh, handy dandy details about each of the issues so that you can read through, understanding, understand what the threat is or what the risk exposure is, and then it, it also gives instructions for how to fix the issue. Hey, um, thank you. On the restricting images to your current site, is that a per image setting thing, or is that global over the whole site? Um, it's a per text format setting. Um, so typically, on your site, you only have a handful of them. Uh, configuration, text format. Um, so typically you have like three or four, maybe more, but it's, uh, you can go to configure your text format and it's, uh, it's right here in the enabled features. So it's just a on and off setting where there's no other setting for it. Um, and yeah, so it's, it, it comes by default, uh, enabled on the basic, on the basic HTML because this is uh, granted access to authenticated users. Um, and anonymous users also don't have, uh, cannot post images. So by default, again, by default, everything is secure. Uh, it's just a matter of you know, keeping those settings secure and tight. As you make you. changes for your config. Okay. 
Um, we're, uh, we're just about at the end of our time, so thanks very much for joining us today. If you have any feedback, you can leave it online or, or uh, just deliver it directly to us. We'll be here chatting for a bit longer. Thanks very much, everybody.